I'm excited to get started. Um, I want to welcome to the show, Joanna Montgomery, the founder of Little Riot and the creator of the internet sensation Pillow Talk, which has been um, recognized globally in over 70 countries, and it's in children's hospitals uh, worldwide. She's also one of the mentors here with the One Day Program, and I'm really excited to get to know a bit more about your journey, Joanna, and kind of how you started in entrepreneurship. Um, I'd like to start with Little Riot and Pillow Talk and talk a little bit about your background as an interactive designer and entrepreneur and kind of what sparked um, this journey for you. Yeah, so my journey starts, I was going to say way back, it is way back now, when I was at university. And yeah, I studied interaction design, which was kind of a hybrid between computer science, but also with an appreciation for design. Um, my university had um, it was quite a new course at the time, and I think my university had realised they had these computer science degrees that were churning out people who could build things and make things work, but maybe didn't have a very good appreciation of the sort of research phase or how to make something user-friendly. And then in a whole other building on the campus, they had all these designers in the design school who were coming up with these amazing ideas, doing all these research, doing all this research and conceptualizing ideas for amazing things, but didn't know if they were even technically possible. And even if they were, didn't have the skills to actually make them work. So we, in theory, were meant to be these hybrid creatures that sat in the middle that had an appreciation of both worlds that could uh, do some user research and come up with good ideas that solve problems but also build things that worked and that were technically possible. So when I started the course the first iPhone had just come out so everyone was like obsessed with um, you know the, the swipe to unlock and the touch screen and the zooming it wasn't um, a really that, exciting time mm -hmm. right so it was a really exciting time to be studying interaction design because people loved that I mean I love I still love that intersection of how as humans we interact with technology and with the devices that change how we experience the world um, and so yeah started my course was super excited for what the world was going to bring and within the space of about two years, everything had become about the smartphone. And mm -hmm. I remember, um, so in our final year at university, we do one project for the whole year. And I remember looking around the studio and just everybody was obsessed with the screen and everybody was just building an app. And I was like, mm, like this is cool, but what's the world going to look like in five, ten years time when we literally are walking around with supercomputers in our pockets? Yeah. And at the time, everybody thought I was being a bit like negative about that trajectory of technology. But I was a bit like, mm, you know, I feel like screens aren't very natural for how we as humans interact with each other and with the world. So I wanted to come up with a way for us to connect with another person when we couldn't be with them without mm -hmm. having to be either interrupted by technology or having to schedule in time to sit on a piece of technology and talk to somebody. So I just thought that was very unnatural. You know, when you come home at night to your partner, to your children, you don't say, oh, let's sit down opposite each other and talk about our day. You just, you know, you just coexist with each other. And I felt like technology doesn't let us coexist with the people we love. So that was where the idea for Pillow Talk came from, was how can I build something that lets me feel connected to another person and lets me feel a sense of another person's presence without me having to actively engage with a piece of technology. Wow. So Pillow Talk connects you with somebody you love and you can't be with them via the sound and the feeling of your heartbeat. So it's a wrist-worn sensor that picks up your heartbeat and sends the sound and the feeling of your heartbeat to a little device that another person has. So most people put it under their pillow when they go to bed at night. It feels a bit like um, putting your head on someone's chest. So wow. um, yeah, so it was my university project originally it was and when it and, and when pillow talk came out it was a bit of an internet sensation so tell us a little bit about you know the take us back to like the first customer because i'm uh, i'm very very curious to know about this for, you know the critical path of getting your first customer but also there was a lot of just noise around you know kind of and and excitement around the product so how did those two feed off of each other and then what did you do with all that 
energy. I mean, you, you kind of grabbed a bit of a moment there. It was it sounded like a really exciting time to be an innovator, entrepreneur, and designer. Yeah. I mean, I had fully planned on graduating, getting a job, you know, going on this sort of conventional path. My parents would now tell you they always knew there was no way <laughs> I was going down the conventional path in life. Um, but yeah, I am um, one of my submissions for my university project was um, a 60 second video. We had to make these little YouTube videos that explained our product concepts. And I made this. That sounds video very well. familiar for the one day folks in attendance or minimal viable product. Mm, or minimal viable yes. Test or explainer videos. In yes. hindsight, Love it. it was Love very it. much the first thing I did. So we had to um, make these little 60 second videos for our university lecturers to just to sort of explain our projects or the idea and how it worked. And I'd made this little story of like a couple who were apart and they kept missing each other on the phone and they missed each other. And then they went to bed, one person went to bed and they could see their pillow was playing a heartbeat and they'd get into bed and feel connected. And I put it on YouTube because I had to submit a YouTube link. And I still, to this day, don't know how it happened. I think I'd be very wealthy um, if I did know how it happened, but it ended up going viral on the internet. So oh. that was very much the first I guess not quite an MVP, but as a concept, the first thing I put out there, um, that resonated with people in a way that made them want to have it, I guess. And almost overnight, I woke up to all these emails from people saying, oh, I read this, I saw this on Wired, I read this on whatever, um, how can I order one? How can I buy one? And I was, you know, I was super young. I was like 21, straight out of university, really naive, thought, how hard can it be to, to build a product? <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, don't worry, I'm going to make them. Um, oh man, no idea what a journey I was in for. I um, love that. Like, talk about lightning in a bottle. I'm seeing some reactions come in through our, our audience here on the chat. Y'all feel free to drop some questions. This is a really great story. And, and I'll, I'll do my best to either surface them as part of the conversation or we'll do a and a session at the end. I'll make sure we address these questions. But you know, so you see, so, so just to recap, you put your minimal viable test, it's an explainer video on YouTube, and it goes nuts. Um, and then you're thinking, well, how hard, how hard could it be? Um, and then so so you, you the, the viral sensation was the YouTube video. And then you come into what building the product or getting the customer tell us what happened from there. How'd you capture some of this momentum? So one of the things I did very early on was was I was conscious that 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 attention could be quite flash in the pan. Fortunately, it did turn out to be a pretty um, sustainable thing, but I was quite intentional about um, building a community around that. So very quick on the socials, very quick to start a mailing list with like um, weekly updates. I, I had quite a big following on like Facebook and that became a really nice sort of hub for um, not just like product updates, but also nurturing my audience in a different way around um, I used to post like relationship tips or like other stories of other people and long distance relationships and how they made them work and that having that constant dialogue with my community and keeping them really involved in what I was building um, turned out to be really instrumental in main maintaining a lot of that momentum um, as I went through what turned out to be a very long um, R&D phase. So this was 2010 I graduated so this was like kind of this was like the technology wasn't even really available for us trying to build like bluetooth low energy wasn't commercially available batteries were huge like trying to get yep. the battery small enough or anything it was four three four years maybe before the first fitbit so i was trying to build technology that would you'd wear as a wristband i had an investor once tell me people would never wear technology on the wrists so <laughs> i kind of i was very much pushing a rock up a hill and because well, I let, felt let, like me, let me ask you this because you're pushing the rock up the hill what kept you going what kept you pushing that rock um so it was two things one of one of them was the emails I got constantly and I was I know I was super lucky to have that where I was receiving like almost constant validation that people wanted this thing so the so days your community, that we your, really your community of fans and customers all right awesome. yeah yeah um and the other one was um, quite early on in my journey. I had a whole, I had quite a lot of people in my life actually that thought I couldn't do it. 
So like when I left university, my friends were like, oh, what are you doing? Like you've been offered a job. You know, I, grad I graduated like a year after um, a recession. So everyone was like, you're so lucky to have a job. And all my friends, like a lot of my friends thought I was crazy and <laughs> told me it was never going to work. And that like nothing lights a fire under me more than being told I'm not going to be able to do something. Awesome. So that was what kept me pushing the rock. All right. So you, so you got, so you got some momentum from, you know, a little bit of the naysayers, some of the, the I don't want to say haters, but naysayers kind of kept your, you know, your fire stoked. But I would say even more importantly, you got customers saying, Hey, do this. I want this. I, I this is resonating with me. There is a, there's something, there is a person that's not in this room that I'm longing for. And I want to feel that I want to feel that they're here and with me. So that's yeah. some powerful, that's some powerful, um, mojo to kind of keep pushing that rock up the hill okay so you're pushing the rock up the hill what's happening next hmm. with the i mean it's a bit of a double-edged sword that thing you talk about because on, on one hand obviously yes there's that validation there's that constant sort of reinforcement that what you're doing is worth doing but the flip side of that was if it, it felt like i had this audience the whole time and I, f I felt like i had a whole mob of people standing outside my house like waiting for me to walk out the door like the, it was like and in some ways, I added to that problem by continuing to foster that community. But that that could be a little bit stressful sometimes because the, the flip side of those good emails was the emails from people that are like, why isn't this out yet? Are you still working on this? What's taking so long? Um, so that could be hard to deal with sometimes. But um, yeah, if, if the, so yeah, so products out there, the ideas out there, got all this validation, decided to try and build it. Um, I got quite lucky with funding in the first instance. I had a bunch of grant right, funding. It's always always a hot button here. But tell tell us about this first round of funding and who it came from and how you got it. Yeah, so I was very lucky in that I got quite a large grant from a UK organisation called Innovate UK. Uh, within like weeks of starting the business, uh, which at the time I probably didn't really realize the magnitude of just as a 21 year old having walked out of university having um a government organization give me taxpayers money as a grant to try and build out this innovation um definitely in hindsight must have given me a lot of credibility that I maybe didn't appreciate at the time um the challenges I mentioned earlier about the technology not really being there for what I was trying to build I very much made that process difficult um, I one of the mistakes I made many many times over was thinking that as a small team or a single found I mean it was a single founder effectively that in order to build this thing I was trying to build the best way to do it was to use an agency so I used all these like engineering houses agencies and at the time the product was still getting a lot of attention in the press and I think a lot of people kind of wanted to jump on the bandwagon to say they'd done it, but maybe didn't necessarily have the skill set to do it. So I wasted a lot of time and money with all various agencies um, trying to trying to build products, prototypes. We did build some things along the way, and, and some of that was having to wait for technologies to catch up in terms of um, sensors to be more efficient, for batteries to become smaller and more wearable. Um, and then it's, it's so seductive though, this, to, just to, to back it up to the third party mm. agencies, right. Whether they're, whether it's the marketing or yeah. the, you know, the digital development or the physical product, it's like, you want it so bad to go. Cause I remember, I remember, um, doing something similar with rocket about the same era. Um, and you know, we were like, well, and I, I came out of playing in bands and, and making indie movies. I didn't know anything about being a technology CEO. So I was like, well, maybe I can just have a service do it. And luckily they just came back with these astronomical prices. And I was like, well, that's not feasible. I'm gonna have to figure this out on my own. But it was so seductive to kind of just go down that path, especially when you're still, you know, young and think, well, these folks have the answers because they've been doing it all along. But often that's not the case. Kind of like the the investor that told you no one's ever gonna wear technology on yeah. their wrist. <laughs> um, yeah. so for me, it was the allure of having access to such a big team because like I was trying to build a consumer electronics product so I needed even though like I had a bit of money and I could have hired people I needed like an electronics engineer a mechanical engineer a software engineer a server engineer I needed like such a broad spectrum of of pe I needed like if I'd hired a team in house to do it would have been 12 14 people which you couldn't afford 
So that was the appeal of an agency. It was, oh, they have all those people and I just pay them this fee and they build it, except it never worked out like that. All right. So that didn't work. Third party didn't work. What did? What was what, what you keep your you're, you're, you got this rock, you're pushing uphill, you're getting feedback from customers, most of it positive. Now folks are starting to get a little antsy saying, hey, where is this, you know, where is this uh, promise that you delivered in a YouTube video from last year? Uh, what's happening now? You got, um, money, so, you got grant money. Um, um, yeah. That's the first tranche. Um, so, and um, so, yeah. Yeah. Wasted all my grant money making mistakes and learning things. Um, in 2013, maybe 2012, 2012 raised my first round of VC funding. Um, so I did a small round. Was the product out by then? No. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, walk us through walk us through that. So you went through the grant money. What did you have a prototype, a working, you know, um model? Yeah, How I had prototypes, these? but they were very clumsy. They were like very ugly. The battery life was abysmal. You could get like one night out of it. They were battery was life was terrible back then. People forget the first iPhone had terrible mm -hmm. battery life too. I mean, it was yeah. really, really uh, um clunky in that way um yeah okay so you got a bit you got a, you know barely a working prototype how did you approach vcs what was the value proposition mm, i mean my prototypes kind of worked enough to give an idea of what the product would be like to use and for me that was a um, quite a big step in terms of that leap from what was an idea in my head to what the product would be like in the world um so i had like various um prototypes i had what what i called like a looks like prototype which was a sort of very i had very shiny renders nice images of what it would look like i had some 3d prints that had, had had really nicely finished so they looked like finished products but didn't work and then the main tool i used to to show it to people and tell them about the product was i actually had i'd made this tiny pillow and i um i'd stuffed some speakers into it and i got an ipod mini and I took a recording of my heartbeat and plugged it into the iPod mini and just stuffed it in the pillow. And um, when you put your hand on it, it felt like the product was like to use. So I just awesome. used to slip that around over. I used to take, whenever I was at a conference or an event or I went to a meeting, I would say, I'd tell them this wacky idea, which still nearly 14 years later sounds crazy. Like, oh, we send the sound and the feeling of your heartbeat to someone. And people are like, what? And then I'm like, here, feel this little pillow. And they're like, oh like oh now I get it like the, the feeling is so tactile so just that that prototype was so powerful for me in terms of getting that buy-in from people and what the product would be like so yeah so first VC round end of 2012 um that enabled me to hire a team and start building bringing the tech in-house so that was when we started to build our own hardware our own software um, those investors were an absolute nightmare so that um that lasted about 18 months and then the that's a story for another conversation um that ended up in a big legal fight where i almost lost the company um fortunately so my for lawyer, all those yeah, for all the founders listening that think like vc is the answer um it it may not be uh, and this is this is you know 2012 so lots changed but this was may have been right at the I'm trying to trying to go through my my memory here muscle memory. it's like right at the beginning of internet of things right so kind of like mm -hmm. you know, at the cusp of that they probably saw an opportunity here with your product you know as as technology was hopping out of the phone and into other places they probably mm -hmm. fit the, the thesis there but um professional money um comes at a cost sometimes so um you know what yeah. were the what were the top two things that were really annoying about this professional money other than almost losing your company to them I couldn't even narrow it down to two. Um, <laughs> I guess that the main issue I had with them was the, so when I was raising the money and we were in the negotiation phase, I understood that we were on opposite sides of the table and we were like, Rrr. but I assumed that once the paperwork was signed and the money was in the bank, we were back on the same side of the table and we were all working towards the same goals. But for some reason they weren't. And for, it just, it always seemed like a game to them. So I'd say, oh, you know, I need your permission as per the legal documents to to spend more than whatever amount on this. And and they'd say, oh, well, we'll give you permission if you do this. And they'd come up with something really random. Like they wanted my board notes formatted differently or they wanted me to change my registered office address to a different bill. They would always, it's just like, 
it felt like they just I don't know they were awful they were awful awful people and it was a very dark time of my life <laughs> that I fortunately made it through managed to save my company raised another round of investment from a corporate venture fund uh, so I had money from Telefonica mm -hmm. their corporate fund in 2015 so that was good so that got rid of those investors and that um, by then the world had moved on a little bit the technology was getting a bit better we had some working prototypes um so yeah 2015 was the first year that we managed to just build sort of 10 or 20 really ugly but functional prototypes to give to customers to test um that was an interesting era because in my original youtube video because i built it to go in an exhibition as part of my degree project um, i put lights in the pillows so mm -hmm. that when somebody put one on and when when a pillow started playing heartbeat it would like glow and so that was in the video as well so that like somebody's sitting in the room and the pillow starts to glow in the bed so they know it's working and my customers were like obsessed with the with the glowing pillow and i thought okay. surely no one wants, surely no one wants a light in their face um so we had developed we were going down the path of there being no light and when we updated our community with our sort of latest product um, plans, they were all, everyone was like, no, where's the glow? We really want the pillow to light up. And I was like, are you sure? Yes, we definitely want the pillow to light up. And I was like, all right, the customer's always right. So fortunately, we then made 10 prototypes with, the, with a light in it and we gave it to people and it had this little sort of flat thing in it with some leds in it that would you'd slot into your pillow and it would glow and um, we gave sort of 10 without to people and we gave 10 with the lights to people and surprise surprise the people with the light quickly came back and said oh it's really annoying having a light in your face when you're trying to sleep and i always bring this up because it's such a good example of not listening to what customers say they want but what they like how they actually behave or like what they actually pay for because what if they i had just what listened, they did. yeah if i had just done surveys um had conversations and you know listened to what they thought they want i would have gone down this whole path of making a completely different product all the expense involved with manufacturing something building something and then i think they still would have bought it but they would have then been like oh there's a light in my face and i would have had to re-engineer it all anyway Amen. Well, that that's why we test, right? So they, yeah. the the product feature set is they indicated they wanted the light. Uh, you delivered one version with the light, uh, and then they came back. You've de delivered a prototype, um, an iteration with the light. They came back, so we don't want the light. So you take that and you factor it into the next iteration. Um, but I love that story, and and um, also I think that it's important to listen to customers and then run the test. It's like, all right, I have a yeah. thesis that you really don't want this light in your face but let me test it because you're telling me that you want it and let's see what the behaviors say. It's what, 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 what someone says versus what someone does. And anybody who knows um, my style of venture innovation knows I'm a big fan of the mom test. Um, and how I fell in love with that book is that somebody mom tested me at city ventures by asking me if I ate, you know, ate healthy. And I said, of course I ate healthy. And I talked about the kinds of foods that I thought I ate. And then they made me walk through the last five meals that I ate. And I was like, Ooh, that doesn't sound very healthy. That, you know, bacon, egg and cheddar bagel that I had out of the street vendor this morning, maybe isn't so maybe I'm not as healthy as I think. So the point is that these these customers aren't necessarily lying. They're just telling what they think they want versus what they're actually doing and, and how they're behaving. So very cool. Um, all right. So this is quite this is quite the journey. So you've got your prototype out. You're just starting to deliver some some, um, you know, uh, some to early customers. You got the version with the light version without the light. You test that. Um, so where do you take an idea this uh, idea furthers? And at this point you're into it a few years, um, you know, you've gotten, um, you know, you basically sustain the business with grants and some professional money at this stage. Uh, what, at what point do you get kind of the, the first official, um, customers coming in the door? So the challenge with hardware is you kind of only get one shot at it. Like the product has to be, um, maybe not perfect, but good enough that it's solving a problem for somebody and that they are happy enough with it that they would buy again or be disappointed if it didn't exist so um we 
I, w- I was very conscious that because I was in hardware and the, sort of the hardware scene was quite new and Kickstarter was quite new and there'd been a lot of stories of things that had launched and then people that either hadn't delivered or projects were super delayed or you know we've all seen pictures of, of the things people have like ordered off Timu and then they turn up and they're like three times the size and you've got these like big massive like chunky trainers or whatever so I was very conscious that I didn't want to be one of those people so I didn't want to um take money off a customer until I knew I was at least within like I had all the, I had the next bit of the abyss figured out mm-hmm. um and so we sort of by the end of 2015 I felt like I was close enough I felt like I'd validate the product I was like happy enough um with the technology we'd done enough testing I felt like I had a good enough grip on the costings that I even if I was a wee bit out I maybe had like 20% leeway to not bankrupt myself um Mm -hmm. so in 2015 we did launch a crowdfunding campaign so we launched for pre-order um and we did that for two reasons three reasons three reasons the first one was um to know how many products to manufacture in the first Mm -hmm. instance because that's really tricky because when you're building hardware you just you've got no idea do you need a thousand do you need ten thousand do you need fifty thousand like no one knows so launching for pre-order helped us establish how many we needed to make Uh, the other thing it did was obviously meant we had that money up front for um for those products so that it meant we could fund that manufacturing run for those products that's that's a huge piece of the of the puzzle yeah Mm -hmm, for sure and the third really lovely thing it did was enabled us to continue to test so we had some assumptions around how people would want to buy it so our product typically comes in pairs and it was mainly being purchased by people in long distance relationships Mm -hmm. and I thought that you know I would order one, I'd buy mine, my other half would order one, he'd buy his to wherever he was. Um, And we had, we struggled in the logistics setup to come up with a solution where somebody could place one order and it would ship to two addresses. And that was proving really difficult because no one had ever tried to do that before. And we'd had all these prices for like custom backend builds for logistics platforms. And it was all like the, the, So when we launched for pre-order, we offered all these different ways of purchasing it, like, you know, single, two, and they split, and almost everybody just bought a pair. Uh Because what what the customers wanted to do was buy a pair, they wanted to receive them, and then they wanted to gift half, literally the half that came from their product to their partner. Not even always in person, they just wanted to you know, put it in a box with some other things and write a letter and send it. So that was a really interesting learning for us because it let us test um, an assumption we had about how people would purchase, which fortunately worked in our favor in the end because if we hadn't done that, we would have wasted so much time and money trying to build this custom logistics solution for something that people didn't even want. I love that. And also for anyone who's listening, shameless plug for tomorrow's crowdfunding session. Uh, but some of the takeaways here will be we will be tackling. So um, I love that you are able to you know use the crowdfunding platform to figure out how much demand there is, how many units do we need to make? You know, um, you know, test how we're going to be shipping shipping this out uh, and also get a grip on some of the logistic issues that that, um, you know, uh, some of the, that you thought you had, you didn't have. Uh, so very, very cool. Um, all right. So you've got, is that, was that, was that your first, was that your first kind of entree into, um, you know, the uh, tackling customers? Was it with the pre-sales crowdfunding um, campaign? Yeah. So from how that did, point how did, on, how, how did it do? Um, yeah. I mean, it didn't, if I'm really honest, it didn't do as well as we thought it would based on the community we had and the audience we had. And I think some of that, again, was an assumption we'd made where we thought the kind of people who were buying a product like ours, which at the time was so, was so out there, still is out there, um, we thought those kind of people were also the people that would be really familiar with crowdfunding platforms. We thought they would, would be on um, Kickstarter and Indie. I don't know if Indiegogo still exists. That was the other big one at the time. And we didn't even we just we just launched on kickstarter and we emailed our mailing list we had about fifty thousand people on the mailing list i think at the time and said 
you know, we're here, it's live, you can pre-order it. And we were getting emails back from people saying, but how do I, how do I order it? <laughs> and we had people messaging us through Kickstarter saying, I want to pre-order one, how do I order one? So again, maybe it's, it's something we should have tested, but we hadn't. And we had a, we created a lot of additional work for ourselves in not only trying to sell a product, but onboard people onto something that was new and they weren't familiar with and didn't feel good about putting their credit card details into. Um, so like, yeah, we ran the campaign for a month. I think we finished on about $125,000, um, mm -hmm. which was like less than expected. And that month was so like, there was like three of us at the time and all we did was just watch that oh. total all the time go to bed. We, we were obsessed. And yeah. when the campaign ended, I thought, oh, now what? I should probably like leave an option open for pre-orders. And I found this, I don't even know what it was. I think it was, I can't remember what it's called. It was effectively this little Stripe plugin or like a very early version of a Stripe plugin that I just botched on with a couple of lines of code onto the middle of our Squarespace site that was like pre-order and would let people, and it looked like the dodgiest thing ever. You clicked on it, it was this little pop-up and you put your card details <laughs> in. And I put it on, I forgot about it. And like our campaign finished on a Friday, whatever. And Monday morning, I was like, oh, oh, look at those, all those orders we got over the weekend. So in the month following our campaign, which was also over Christmas and into January, we did more in organic pre-orders on the website than we had done on Kickstarter, chasing that, pushing that for a month and trying to educate people on what Kickstarter was. So yeah, if I was going to do that again, I would just run my own pre-order solution rather than than trying to use a platform. Wow. So, um, and by the way, you were doing this organically. You weren't using, you know, promotional agencies and buying ads. This is back when, when, when crowdfunding was, was crowdfunding. It was the community deciding kind of how things were going to get made and what was getting funded. And we weren't buying a bunch of ads and hoping that, you know, those customers converted. These were folks that were in your community, following your newsletter, following your, your videos absolutely fantastic and incredibly well done i mean that even back then even now that's a rare air six figure raises in the world of crowdfunding from an organic push very very rare air but you were you know i see so many i feel so many uh parallels because at that time the standards were so big and so high so rocket up was right right on the cusp of like being with indiegogo and kickstarter we were right behind them but because we weren't, you know, um, um, you know, uh, because we weren't, you know, as massive as other technology companies, we always felt so, so small. <laughs> but we ended up, you know, ha having, um, you know, quite, quite an impact. And one of the things, interestingly enough, was teaching folks around crowdfunding. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, you're right, people didn't know much about it, and and I think even now there's a lot of myths and and kind of, um, you know, missteps around along the way. So, um, very, very fascinating that you found success with the platform, but just as much success, if not more on your own site. But I also think that speaks to the credibility that you built with your community because it wasn't just some rando, you know, um, um, you know, uh, uh, Shopify or, or plug and play site. It was your site where they had a relationship with y'all. You had a social capital built and you were ready to kind of, you know, leverage that. Um, so you got your first, you know, how many, so you sell a couple hundred thousand worth of these things. It's a lot. Um, how many units, how did you deploy them? How did you deliver, you know, tell, walk through all that. Yeah. So we, we didn't, we, we didn't manage to stick completely to schedule. We did slip about six months, which in the world of hardware and crowdfunding was like still not the end of the world. Um, so we, then once we had that money in, got to finally, finally move forward into the stage of actually like building the products, and manufacturing them. Um, and it's one of the things that I got really right in my journey was picking a really great partner in China because that's the one bit that if I'd, if I'd got my factory wrong, like I had one shot at that with that money and with the tooling and all that. I, I, I don't even want to think what would have happened if that had gone wrong. Um, and so yeah and how so did you find partner. that partner how did you find that partner so I originally found him through I think my I'd had the very final stages of my product design done and um, the stage it's called the DFM stage the design for manufacture and um, was done by 
an agency but they were an okay agency in the end in London they just did like a little bit of work for us mainly just around the specifics of you know could something be manufactured how would they join together where were the screw holes going to go where were the injection molding points um and they had worked with a company in New York that had quite recently made a children's toy like some sort of interactive it was um I can't remember what it was called um hack a ball or something it was like a kid's mm -hmm. toy that um, had an app that went with it um and they said that they'd been quite happy with their manufacturer and maybe i should speak to him and it was a wee bit of a leap from toys to what we were doing but i thought it's close enough for me in terms of um the products have to be quite high quality if they're toys because they're used by like children and he they'd obviously strayed into that electronics interactive sort of area um so there was like him but nobody had ever worked with him i think they hadn't mass produced that product in the end so they said oh we were maybe going to use this guy but never made the product in the end and then i had all these other people recommended to me and i did a lot of due diligence spoke to a lot of people spoke to their prior customers and i narrowed it down to two and in the end the guy i picked it i mean i think it's good advice but i just picked off my gut instinct yeah. and quite a lot of other people were like oh no like you shouldn't you should use this other guy he's based in the uk he's british you like you, in terms of like communication around very minor tweaks he's like that'll be much easier with somebody where you can communicate in your native language and i was like oh i don't know this guy's just really nice and he brought his son to a business meeting and i just don't know i get a good vibe from him <laughs> but well, you did well to be fair you did both right you did your due diligence on mm. both on both candidates and when they both yeah. are you know have a a clean bill of, of health on the DD side, then you go with the heart, which I think yeah. is, is a good steer. Yeah, because interestingly, that's the thing that went wrong with those investors. Like I look back now and those bad investors, I knew it felt off. I knew it felt off. And I let people that were older than me, that I thought were smarter than me and more experienced than me, tell me that I couldn't make decisions and I couldn't run a business on gut instinct. And that was he uh, had a part-time fd at the time who was like this white man in his 50s and he made me write a list of pros and cons for signing the term sheet versus not and the only con was that it didn't feel right and that was like the biggest mistake i made at any point in my business journey so with my factory it's something that like i it really worked for me was just going with my gut instinct on my with my factory partner so he turned out awesome. to be an absolute gem um, and yeah, I spent, it was really exciting actually. I used to go to China for like months at a time, um, which was a whole like experience in itself. But as and a, how many how many units did you end up have? Did, did this um, factory end up making for you? So in the first batch, I think we did ten thousand the first time. Mm -hmm. We pre sold about between our um, crowdfunding campaign and our pre-orders and then we had some like early um orders from like distributors um and for for those and then to have a bit of stock to just work with and start our like ordinary sales um yeah we needed about ten thousand, so we just started with with that awesome and then you know the, this list that had fifty thousand plus members on it yeah you know, how did you grow that i mean you did it over a few years but what was the strategy there and what what are some of the takeaways we could put into play from that because that's that's yeah. a powerful powerful list that when you launch and you're able to sell you're able to sell pre-sell hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of product i mean you know that's 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 quite a community um 50,000 plus members on a newsletter how did you how did you build that i mean i need to caveat it by saying we were super lucky in that we had a lot of press for a product just because it's 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 nice right and it, especially around like valentine's day like memorial day that sort of thing um we got a lot of organic press and publicity and that always just drove eyeballs to our site um but in terms of like consciously growing it and nurturing it it was just about that um process of very much bringing our community on the journey with us so i used to I, I sometimes find them on my youtube channel now i think i've made most of them private now but i had all these really naff videos of like updates <laughs> of like what we'd done that week and like what we're working on or like behind the scenes in china and we just we just posted these weekly updates um, and sent them out to the mailing list of yeah what was happening and sometimes we would 
ask our community to weigh in on oh do you think we should use this color or this color or what do you think about like this packaging design versus this packaging design and I think people really love feeling like they're part of something as well and so that having that having that relationship and having them play that role in the development of the product also made them much more relaxed about any like potential delays or whenever there's a problem I was never I used to always feel very anxious about having to communicate a delay um, but I realized quite early on that actually way better to communicate that early on and for them you know there's always one or two nasty emails but for the most part people were like okay no we're cool we get it like what can we help you with this week like what, what do you want us to pick this week so yeah that's um just absolutely fascinating. There's so much here, so much good stuff here. The basically giving, you know, I don't want to say ownership, but emotional ownership uh, to the community to some to some point, asking them what color or what kind of fabric or what how you, how they want to shape it um, is incredibly powerful because then it does it becomes more than just your thing. It's their thing. I think that's part of the the Jedi mind trick with this. Um, absolutely fascinating. So. You've got your tens of thousands of units. You're in. You're in China. You're. You know. Your boots on the ground, overseeing the 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 development of this in the factory. Tell us about how things are received by customers, and we're still in the B two B phase of this business, which you know there was a whole other pivot that you made. It seems like to get into hospitals. So, walk us through kind of how this full cycle got delivered. The, your your first customers got your B two C customers you know, uh, how it was received and then how you leverage that momentum into, um, you know, uh, pivoting into B2B success. Yeah. So for the, like, for the most part, it was really well received. People were really happy with it. We got some really, like, I've had some really lovely emails, um, especially in that first few weeks we made, we, we really pulled out the stops to get it shipped to people before Christmas. So most of them started to arrive um, in December. So people were able to, having pre-ordered them, you know, over a year before, not quite a year before, yeah, but a year and a half before, um, people were able to to finally gift them to their to their partners for Christmas. So yeah, feedback was really good. Um, and then we got to sort of move into that exciting role of like scaling the business. We started to take it to trade shows, to industry events, to sort of build out the um B two B to C side of working with distributors, retailers, sort of bigger orders, wholesale orders. Um, and then in 2017, I think, we had a children's hospital in the Netherlands get in touch. And they said, we read about Pillow Talk in a Dutch newspaper. We love it. So, um, so they reached out to you. Yeah. Again, okay. super lucky. Like so much of my story is is like hard work just piled on top of luck. Um, and yeah, they reached out to us and said, we'd love to try it. Um, in our uh, children's, it was a cardio ward, so children that had had heart surgery under the age of two who had come back from surgery and attached to lots of tubes and drains and were too sick to be taken out of bed. And they said, oh, we thought it would be really nice for the, the children to be able to hear their mother's heartbeat. Can we can we use it? And I was a bit like, oh, well, it was always kind of, it was always on the roadmap for someday, but I'd assumed I'd have to do many more rounds of investment um, and I didn't know what that that journey into that medical world would look like or what it would involve in terms of like legislation and compliance. And they were just so great to work with. Like I can see why the Dutch have such a good reputation for innovation because they they said, oh, is it CE marked? Can we wipe it down with alcohol? Like, great, we'll write the risk assessment. It'll all be fine. So they did choose the consumer product as it was for their pilot. And I think at the time we all just thought we were doing it as a, as a nice to have as a comfort piece for uh, for the you know the families in these really difficult situations but because they ran it as a medical pilot what they discovered was that the children that could hear their mother's heartbeats were actually calmer in hospital so they fidgeted less their breathing rate was lower uh, they scored better on what's called the comfort scale and um, which means overall they're like less distressed and less pain uh, so long term, it can actually have a positive impact on their recovery and potentially reduce the time a child has to spend in hospital. I'm getting goosebumps over here. <laughs> How does that feel? How does that feel as a founder to create something that has that kind of impact? Oh, like unreal. The first time. So when I went over there to set up the pilot and I watched it being used in 
in this situation and like saw the parents and saw the relief it brought the parents in that situation I just I remember the moment was so profound I remember thinking if I walk out of here and get hit by a bus like I've made my contribution to the earth like I've done something um yeah so it's been really amazing so powerful wow like I said I'm getting I'm getting choked up getting goosebumps um I do want to talk a little bit about so you got you know you had some some luck along the way, I would argue you kind of prepared for that luck by working really, really hard. Um, and you were, you, you also really captured the opportunity when it came in. A lot of folks don't do that. Like I remember having something similar when a &E networks reached out to, to rocket hub wanting to do a documentary on us. And I'm like, I'll be there in 15 minutes. Like, when do you want to make this deal happen? I'm ready to go now. Um, and and just making sure you answer the phone and you take the meeting and you you know follow through and you know sometimes what you really have to recognize those opportunities and and jump on them and make the most out of them. But let's talk about some of the stuff that the unlucky breaks because part of what strikes me as being a big piece of your success is just this resilience. And we talked a little bit about some of the emotional fuel that you used, um, you know, your community and even the naysayers, you know, kind mm -hmm. of being fuel for the fire but what were some of the specific walk me through a specific challenge that you had where you're like i'm not sure i'm going to make it through this and then what did you do to make it through this and then what do you do now i think the most challenging part along the journey was probably 2018 which was just after we had um so we shipped the end of 2017 our first batch of products went out and i hadn't really realized how much of everything I'd been carrying like as a single founder and all the like the stress with my um, investors and then having to raise more money and that constant like hand-to-mouth feeling of of like struggling along and always being very close to the cliff edge and to then have shipped the product I mean from the we were profitable from the point that we launched for pre-order and to so we, yeah, so we fulfilled all our pre-orders, shipped the product. Then I hired this really amazing like operations girl. And that was the first time that I felt like I had a little bit of like space from, from having to carry all of it and keep all of the plates spinning. And I took a week off and I went on holiday and I just, my body just like, it was done. I just like, I, I was absolutely exhausted. I couldn't sleep my hair was falling out I started to gain weight and I just I got so ill so quickly with this this weird fatigue and I was going to the doctors and they didn't know what was wrong with me and they they kept doing all these tests at one point they said oh you you might you might just have MS it's like I don't think you can just drop that in a doctor's appointment but they eventually referred me um to an endocrinologist and what they discovered was that I basically I had just fried myself I had like really bad adrenal fatigue my cortisol was through the roof my adrenaline was through the roof and my central nervous system was just fried um, and it was just years of stress <laughs> and I just my body just gave out on me and it was really frustrating because I'd worked for so hard for so long to get to that point of really being able to aggressively like scale a bit like I was at the bottom of my like hockey stick curve and I was, I was like ready to go. And then my body was like, nope, we are just going to sit on the sofa for 10 hours a day. And it was, oh, it was horrible. I just wouldn't, I would not wish that for my worst enemy. Um, so that really forced me to, I mean, I had no choice but to slow down. I literally couldn't do anything else. So the, the comeback from that was quite long and quite slow. And it made me really intentional about, like what I wanted for my life and what kind of business I wanted to build and was I going to was I going to raise more VC money and pursue that really aggressive growth curve or actually like, did I want to build a different kind of business and I, I kind of reached the point where I was like you know I do all this good in the world and it's kind of growing it's not hockey, hockey stick curving that way but it's it's growing and it's doing good in the world and the right I'm attracting the right opportunities to us mm -hmm. you know the, the hospitals that are interested are coming to it like maybe maybe this is the, maybe this is the way I want to do it and that is kind of controversial in the world of sure 
startups and, and high growth businesses. Saying it's, enough is enough is enough, right? That's hmm, not that, this, this yeah. style. We came, you know, we we were both growing our startups at the same time, where it was just like unicorn or or bust, or right? Nothing, yeah. and, and, and so I I um, can relate to much of the story. Um, and so now you've landed in a spot like where you know what is your current perspective then on on the venture and and success as an entrepreneur? I mean, I think every there's like a different route for every business, right? It just depends what kind of business you want to build. It depends where you're at in life. It depends what your priorities are. It depends what kind of product you're building. You know, some products, some technologies, if it's a very tech heavy solution, if it's something that needs a huge team, like you you potentially can't do it without raising money to do it. And if you're going to raise money, then you're, you're sort of setting yourself off on that on that um, trajectory of having investors breathing down the back of your neck, expecting you to put your business above all else and to move fast and break things. Um, but for some people, that's not the right, you know, there are other ways now. And I think, I think the VC bubble is not completely bursting, but there's, you know, we're just as founders, I think we're all becoming more aware that there, there are other options and other ways to do things and that we can, build sustainable businesses and do a lot of good in the world and create jobs and have perfectly nice lives yes. without having to burn ourselves out in the process. Wonderful. I love that. Not and um we've got a few minutes left here for QA. So we've got a couple of questions that have popped up. Um and also I hope you all have been paying attention because we've got a little quiz at the end of this that's going to pop up as we start to uh answer some or um get some of these questions. Um Fielded, but um, I just want to thank you, Joanna, because this has been an awesome story of of resilience and and a very inspirational on sticking with it and listening to customers and building an audience and testing and there's so much to unpack um, in here. Um, so, Veronica, I see you've got a hand raised. Maybe you can drop in the chat your um, your um, your question. I'm happy to 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 take it there. Uh, we got some uh, a question here from Hunter saying, "Wonder if you had pressure to turn the idea into a digital product versus uh, creating a physical one, and did you ever consider building your own, uh, um, selling your own pillow with the um, with the technology built in?" So that's one of the questions we have here uh, from Hunter. Um, so quite early on, so the main person I used to hear that from was investors. I think when I first started raising money investors were still quite scared of hardware and um, physical things uh, they were very i think less so in the us the us were a lot more open to it but especially in europe they were all very worried about hardware and didn't want to touch it so quite often investors would say oh we like love the product we love the concept we love that you have this massive community and this huge wait list but like can you just make an app and i was like no <laughs> kind of defeats the point um i think the other reason that drove that was the VC world at that point was very much focused around a SaaS model and investors couldn't get their head around any other sort of business model. So they thought if I made it an app and could charge a monthly subscription, that then became something they would understand. Um, it's something we've thought about more recently, actually, now that there are so many um, smartwatches on the, in the, on the market, that so many people have um, Apple watches, Fitbits, Garmin's, whatever, is we are exploring what a, what a sort of stripped back product would look like in order to make it a bit more accessible um, to sort of other healthcare situations or like um, yeah, areas with less resource is can we sort of utilize the APIs in all those existing products and, and maybe just offer the sort of end piece of the product, which is like something that feels like, like the heartbeat and then and facilitate the connection that way. So, maybe so the, we continue things. to iterate. Um, and we've got a question here from Veronica. Have you have you dove into the research of how your product assists traumatized children, orphan, and or those separated from their primary caregiver? So the idea of of some folks that have been traumatized or separated. Uh, not specifically. We've done various. Um, we've done. Um, yeah, obviously children's hospitals, children that have had surgery. We've done premature um, babies. We've done um, children's palliative care is the other one we've done quite a lot of. Um, so children um, that are in a hospice at the end of their life. Um, and we've done a little bit, but not 
in our sort of research um, capacity, we get a lot of emails from people that have um, like anxiety or depression or sleep disorders that report using it as really beneficial to them in terms of um, reducing distress or anxiety they feel when they're alone. So I would imagine there are some some sort of crossover benefits to um, traumatized children. Yeah, wonderful. Well, um, anyone has any more questions? We still got, you know, about two minutes here. I've got one quick one, uh, if nobody else has one, about just kind of parting wisdom to these hardware founders. I mean, has it gotten easier? Um, has it gotten harder? Like what, you know, what, what, um, you know, what words of wisdom for you have, do you have for folks that are creating hardware products uh, in the current era? Oh, I think it's got way easier. <laughs> like, I think it's way easier um, than it was now for various reasons. Um, some is that a lot of the things you're trying to build something close to it's probably been built before so your starting point is already a lot more comprehensive than mine was in terms of like sourcing something just modifying something and um, we call it like white labeling um any sort of physical product that you want to sell there are now much better infrastructures um between wherever you want to manufacture whether that's asia or um europe a lot of clothing is done in, in portugal um, in India or like Mexico is another big manufacturing hub and there are so many um, services and solutions now that, that you know cross these borders and and make it easier for people like us to to, to work with these countries to to bring our ideas to life so um, if you are a hardware founder or a physical product founder don't give up hope <laughs> despite my story and um, I can definitely help you make it easier. Wonderful. Well, I appreciate you sharing this story, Joanna. Really fascinating. Um, and I learned a lot. So thank you so much. Um, also, too, for those who have taken the quiz, we had a couple of questions here. So if you haven't gotten them in there, please get them in there. Um, and the, West, uh, the best way to fund your business, um, we had um, A, VC investment, B, grant funding, and C, there is no right way. Joanna, what was the right answer there? The right answer is C. There is no right way. It very much depends on what kind of business you're building. Awesome. Yeah, I would agree with that. And it looks like you had a variety of everything. So um, what well, love that case study it really encapsulates that question well. Then the other question was, what is the most important factor when expanding your business? A, having a good business plan that you can follow. B, talking to customers at every stage. Or C, getting a cool office with your logo on the wall. Which one was it? It was B, speaking to your customers at every stage. As I at every stage, right? Even, even, when, even, when they, even when they tell, even when they tell you they want a blinking light, listen yeah. to them, test it, and then when they actually show you they don't want the blinking light, then we can iterate. I love that. What a great story! All right, awesome. Well, thank you everybody for for coming and participating. We got some great questions in the chat. Uh, Samantha, thanks for all your support. Uh, great to see some of these uh, wonderful, familiar faces from the one day community. Joanna, I literally got goosebumps. I'm glad I didn't start to to uh, to tear up in some of that interview. So <laughs> thanks for sticking with me through it. Um, really wonderful um, story. So thanks again.